get started. Let's see if I can move these around. I'm kind of tall. Okay. Uh, my name is Dave Cox. I'm the CEO of Pure Discovery out of Dallas, Texas. Uh, you can be dropping into my Texas slang every now and then. You'll have to excuse that. Um, a couple things. We, uh, our company's Pure Discovery, but we actually have changed the name. Uh, officially, it's, it's called, we are called Brainspace now. Um, and I wanted to talk to you today about an idea that we have uh, that we're out to uh, create in the science community um, around communities. Um, so there's a lot of talk in the I attend a lot of sessions um, and there's a lot of talk about community and what's not working and, and how sharing is inhibited and, and how there's not motivation for sharing and a lot of conversation about why communities don't work and I think you'll see we have some pretty good ideas. Um, I'm gonna get a little bit into just talking about the, uh, the problem and uh, what we're out to solve but then we'll get in the end I'll get in some live demos and show you some technology. That's kind of fun and then um, We'll give everybody an opportunity to then just register. Uh, we'll be launching a uh, global community uh, in the next uh, seven days, and you can be a part of that. So, um, if you like what you hear today, my, I'm Dave Cops, and my Twitter ID is I'm Dave O. If you don't like it or are offended by what I'm saying, I'm Miley Cyrus. <laughs> <laughs> I heard she was going to be a keynote, but then she wanted to talk on um, charm twerks, and it didn't fly. <laughs> I'm a one-man band today. Uh, the gentleman that's supposed to be with me uh, had some uh, parenting. He has a young child that's coming a little sooner than thought. So uh, anyway, I'll be. Uh, we'll make as interactive as possible. I probably won't have time to uh, look down at my Twitter, but please do put that out uh, tweet, and I'll be glad to respond back uh, if you have any questions or comments. Um, so we'll talk about challenges and building communities. Um, what works, what doesn't work. Uh, the concept of connectedness. I'm going to talk a lot about that today. What does that mean when I say that? And then we're going to get into some live some live stuff. Um, so things are pretty bad. When you look at this, the, the outlook out there, um, typically we, we're talking about tools. You know, everybody says there's different types of tools. There's search tools, collaboration tools, social networking tools, they're all tools. Um, search is in especially bad shape. About 50% of all searches fail. In other words, you're not finding what you're looking for. Um, the improvement over the last 10 years is 0%. That's actually pretty generous. It's getting worse. It's getting a lot worse because the, big, you know, the challenge is the big data. There's more data and we're attacking the same problems with the same engines and the same things that we've done in the past. Um, so the average time spent searching, this stack can go anywhere from 25% to 50% for knowledge workers, so researchers, scientists, you're spending a lot of time searching. Um, and that's actually gone up over the last 10 years. So, um, you know, it's costly. So even in organizations, uh, it's about $28 million per thousand employees, knowledge workers, that, uh, that they spend just on searching, just searching. So you can start to imagine $28,000 if someone's making about $80,000 a year. <laughs> it's about $28,000 of your salary goes towards searching. Put, keep it in perspective. Um, so collaboration tools, same kind of thing, a lot of promise. 90% of people want them. Only 10% of them uh, actually uh, adopt <coughs> them well, and 63% see a very low benefit. And that was a survey they did uh, on collaboration systems where they rated 12 different things that they, they graded. And, no one chose more than four that they were happy with. So, and then social networks. We've all joined one or two or three or four or 10. Um, you know, they're, they're still evolving. They're not there yet. 20% um, are successful, 62% uh, are average or poor, and 80% are predicted to fail. So it's, you know, so if all these things aren't working, why is that? Why don't they work? You know, it's, uh, this is one of the things that keeps me up at night. <laughs> uh, used to be other things, but. Now I think about this stuff, <laughs> but, uh, uh, but they're all tools, you know, so, and we, uh, I even, it's funny because we talk about running a tools track, right, but, you know, tools have it in order to, I use a tool to do this, I use a tool to do that, right, there's not this, this idea that I'm connecting with people when I use a tool, a tool seems like a very personal thing, I mean, all the tools are basically based on search, and you think about what they do, collaboration tools, and finding documents and people, it's all search, and that's bad because, Search is basically fundamentally flawed. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's actually, how many have seen the movie Fifty First Dates? Anybody seen that? So generally, Drew Barrymore, uh, I think she's in a car accident, and uh, she wakes up every morning having lost her entire memory. So every day is a new day, literally. That's kind of like what search is like today. So basically, amnesia comes standard with search. You do the same search you did, today, tomorrow, 
and nothing changes. You might get some new documents, but the idea that you're searching on hasn't changed in your query at all, even though in the world it's changed. There's been changes in that. So why? Why do we do that? The other thing we do that's silly in search is that uh, relevance is normalized. You know? So what I mean by that is every word, you know, we, we treat search uh, documents as buckets of keywords. That's the way we treat search today. That's all documents are, buckets of keywords. And we give them all numbers and relevance, and they're all given the same relevance regardless of topic. And documents are all treated as equal. So I have a database of a million documents. Before I hit the search button, every single one of them has an equal chance of uh, coming back to my results screen. That's silly, too, because of those million documents, they're not equal. Some are good and some are bad. That's why you spend so much time searching. So in siloed indexes, I think this is the craziest thing about search, is everybody in this room, if you're uh, searching a database, you're all searching it simultaneously and in a silo. You're not connected to each other when you're doing it. You're not learning from each other as you do it. You're a silo into that database. So there's no learning that's occurring. So what's missing? Connectedness. We really don't need any more tools. We don't need any more search engines. We don't need any more social networks. We don't need any more silos. What we need is for connectedness, this, thing, this idea that you can be connected to things that matter to you, to be part of the fabric of what you do every day. So when you're looking at a document, that, that document, um, you know, it, it automatically is finding other documents that are similar, or people that might know about that, or uh, someone that wrote a paper about that, or a person that's collecting documents that are related to that. It's just a fabric, we're connected, it's just part of the fabric of what we do. Basically in communities when, con when connectivity, connectedness is lacking, the ideas lay dormant. Did anybody t attend uh, Salvatore Mele's talk, the keynote? Wasn't that great? So one of the things he talked about was this. You know, he said we had thousands of scientists around the world for dozens of years, and he talked about how in the early days they were mailing things. And over time it became email. And, but as those things happened, things accelerated. You know, so we have the ability to accelerate innovation, but it all lies in our ability to connect with each other and to connect with things that are relevant to our interests quicker and faster. So ideas lay dormant when things are connected. Ideas are slow to emerge. There's less innovation in the world. When connectedness is present, ideas are born. Um, there's a book uh, by a gentleman named Kevin Kelly. He talks, it's called What Technology Wants. And he, has this, uh, he talks about how innovation occurs, how any one moment in time, two people, five people, 100 people around the world can be thinking the exact same idea at the same time, but none of them know each other. And they're not connected to each other. So these silos push forward at a certain rate. When they start to accelerate is when those people meet each other. And so there are studies on this, that the more connectedness that's present between people with similar passions, the faster ideas move. So new ideas are born, passionate people find each other, solutions emerge, innovation accelerates, magic happens. So when I talk about connectedness, what does that really look like? And you think of me, you hear me say the word, but what does it look like? So we, if you have a document, let's just say you highlight a paragraph. This paragraph is really interesting to me. What if you were instantly connected with related people, people that knew about that inside your organization, outside your organization on the web? What if you were connected to related documents instantly, just by what you highlighted? What if you could find curated collections of knowledge that's related to what that paragraph's about? If you could find those just automatically and dynamically, and what you could find, I'm going to call them social objects. And basically, the idea of a social object, that we, the way we describe it, is anything, not just a document, anything two people use to connect. It could be an equation. You know, I have this equation, I want to connect with you because I sent it to you, we're going to talk about it. It could be a document, it could be a picture, it could be anything, a social object. Part of this, this talk, I would hope if you walk away with anything, is that we have to get beyond this idea that we're a document-centric world. You know, um, Documents have been great for a long time, but really it's not about searching the words anymore. It's about how are we using these things as containers, like a document. How are we using that to connect with people? How is that document used to connect two people or five people or ten people? There's a social aspect to knowledge that is still not being reflected in the market. So, we got this idea. It really started like eight years ago. I started my one of my first companies, I'm kind of a serial entrepreneur. My wife tells me I'm a serial entrepreneur because I'm unemployable. I think she's <laughs> probably right. <laughs> I, I can't work at a company. I'm, I'm, a, I, I, I'm a little too 
I, I want to build things. And uh, not moving fast sometimes doesn't work in big companies. But I um, had this idea even eight years ago, I called it web consciousness. Like, what, if, what if I could put a brain over the web? What if I could look at all the documents out there on the web, learn from them, and put the brain over the web, let people use the brain? So you could look at something and be connected to other things that are related because the brain helps connect you. Um, we're essentially doing that. So we built a technology, rather than bore you on the details, I'm welcome to go deeper to anybody that wants to later, I'll try and keep it. Uh, but um, essentially a brain is this, it's, it's a hyperspace. So we take words and documents, we put them all together in a big bucket and our technology reads them. And it starts to look at how patterns emerge, how words are used in context with other words and how people get related to other, other words. And, and it builds literally a, a hyperspace, like 360 dimensions. You can almost imagine standing in the middle of a sphere and looking around and seeing words and phrases floating around. And essentially, um, you put something into it, a word, a paragraph, something that you're interested in, it goes into the hyperspace and finds all these things that are related, pulls them out, and then uses that to build queries to find things for you. It's, a, um, it were, it's not just an idea. We're actually, our technology is uh, in some of the largest company, corporations in the world. Uh, we built a brain space on the world's collection of patents. Uh, that people use through LexisNexis. So you can actually uh, use a patent brain that was built by taking all the patents in the world, putting them in a bucket. We built this multi-dimensional space on patents. So when people highlight a paragraph or word, an abstract, they're instantly connected with other things that are related to that. Um, but the brain's smart. This idea is that um, one thing that's missing in communities is that glue that holds everybody together. How do you hold everybody together if we're just doing searches in silos? What if, as you collected things, as you shared things, as you found things, a brain learned about that and built a collective intelligence for your whole community? So we're launching a community on uh, GreenWeb in the next two weeks. So it's 5,000 people around the world who are basically uh, clean tech people. So they have no way to connect with each other meaningfully right now. They, they built a, a social network from one of the sites out there. It's not working. You know, it never does. I mean, people. If, they, if they're tools, it doesn't work. They've come to us. These guys, people all over the world are going to be collecting, sharing, collaborating on documents on clean tech. And as they do that, we're building a brain. It's starting to understand the things that they're interested in, the patterns and the communication that happens within that group that drive it. And that brain powers discovery inside the community. So next time a person in that community is looking at a document, the brain's reading it and understanding what it's about sub-second and automatically connecting with people or things or other documents that are related to that. I'm going to show you some of that today. Um, it's driven by social curation. This is pretty big for us. So right now, we're, um, we had this idea to, I told you eight years ago, I thought about what if I could put a brain over the web. We're doing it now. And one of the big breakthroughs was understanding that we couldn't go to every publisher in the world and grab all their documents and build this massive brain on all the documents that are out there. It doesn't make sense. What made more sense is, what if we just took the stuff that's being shared online, socially curated through Twitter and other social services? So that's what we did. Um, we started, we took the top 50,000, or actually I think 30,000 most influential people <coughs> on Twitter, and we started pulling down every tweet that they tweeted out that had a document link in it. So we took all those documents and put one more filter on it. That document had to be tweeted by at least two more people or retweeted twice. With that filter, we take all those documents down that match the criteria, and we build a brain on it. So in essence, we're using Twitter to socially curate the web, and we're building a brain on top of that socially curated web, that socially curated documents. And I'm going to show you a, a demo today that's using that brain. I also added 1,700 scientists, so we can do a little research about coming out, give, give the science brain a jump start. Uh, went and found lists of the top tweeters of all, lots of different areas of science, found about 1,700 names, uh, went back and we grabbed everything that they've been sharing over about the last year, and they're now in place to we'll also see what they're sharing, documents they're sharing uh, going forward. And that's a part of the spring as well. Um, but um, let's see, yeah, we're getting about 50,000 new docs a day, uh, you know, so half a million documents every 10 days at the brain. Um, so it gets bigger and bigger. Next year, this thing will be in the hundreds of millions of documents, the intelligence that we're growing. Um, 
And essentially, uh, the other thing that happens is people, we want to learn about interests, you know, so how do we connect you with things that matter to you, and how do we make you discoverable? Um, one of the things that was interesting to me in all the, the topics I'm hearing today is that people are saying, how do I get known for what I'm interested in, or how do I, how do I get attention for the things that I'm passionate about? Well, in this system, as you create collections, and collections could be documents you found about something you know about, could be also a collection of just things you've written and published, whether it's you know, a journal or a blog or what have you. But that collection, in any other technology in the world, would be like the pennies in a jar, right? The read it later function you see in lots of products, where you go out there, you put things, and you want to read them later, and you never do, right? <laughs> they sit there forever. Um, in our system, your collections actually become agents. As you collect documents on a topic, the brain space reads those documents and understands what they're about and starts drawing in other things that are related to that. Um, we put in the social thing in the next couple weeks here, it's not going to just draw the documents that are related, it's going to draw in people. You'll be able to find people that are interested in uh, things that you're interested in. So, um, sharing. Um, sharing is huge, and I think I already talked about this, so I'll jump by it, but documents become social objects again. So. Um, if you see something you like and it reminds you of a person that you want to talk about, you can use a document to get to that person. So it's a very important part of the system of sharing. All these different types of curation, sharing, collecting, collaborating, mean something in building the brain. Um, and we do have search, <laughs> for those that just have to have it. <laughs> um, so it's really a different philosophy. So we, we believe that the social curation in the community should drive the intelligence that the community is creating. So as people are collecting, sharing, collaborating, they're building an intelligence together that everybody gets to use to match more intelligent other documents. Um, I've talked about that. So collections become interests as you build collections on certain topics. You can be discoverable on, discoverable on those interests. Uh, when someone's highlighting a paragraph on something you have a collection on, your curated collection might show up if you choose it to be. There will be the ability for you to build collections that are completely closed and not discoverable. <laughs> um, let's show you some technology. So I'm going to show you a couple things. And the first thing I'm going to show you um, is not what you're probably expecting to see. This is, this is a little bit more of a deep research product. So I want to show you two things. The second thing I'll show you is the tool I've been describing with, with the social curation tool. But the reason I wanted to show you this is um, you get to see how the brain works. It's kind of fun to dive into it. But in this case, we took, um, let me, uh, here we go. In this case, I've got uh, 240,000 documents from Medline. They're randomly selected, so it's a small set. Um, we have brains, uh, like I said, as, as big as 350 million, 400 million documents. It's a small demo set. Um, but essentially, uh, <laughs> so Medline took 250,000 documents, built a brain on it. Um, those documents probably took, that brain probably took 20 minutes. So as a benchmark, a million document brain takes about 45 minutes. Um, so what do you do when you have a brain? Well, this is just, like I said, a deep research app. This is not the every person app. I'll show that to you in a moment, but I wanted you to see how brains work. So we tell you lots of things. We tell you how many original documents you have in your dupes and exact dupes. We tell you when the documents occurred in a timeline. You could actually even select a, a few years and say, just show me the documents in those five years. And now you're down to 28,500 documents. Um, I could even say I'm really more interested in things that are related to dental and to LS11, the person, and, um, and I'm down to two results. Went from a quarter million down to two results in about three clicks. Um, but even more powerful is this ability to search using the brain that you built. So again, quarter million documents in Medline, let's, do some, let's have some fun. All right, last session, someone said something about um, um, Angiogenesis. So I guess it's restricting the blood flow to a tumor, right? <laughs> um, expanding the concept. So what happens? So I get to peek inside the brain now. Keep in mind, I've only given it one word. And by the way, I want to make sure everyone realizes this is not, there's no lexicon, no thesaurus, no taxonomy, no word net, no prescripted logic at all. Um, I gave it a word like angiogenesis and it comes back with things like angiogenic, vascular endothelial, VGGF, all these things are related to, to uh, angiogenesis. Um, it even goes down hundreds of terms, I can even find things down here that might be related and if I like them I can drag them up. But here's what's interesting, I get to interact with the brain. So if I wanted to use this as a query and learn more about that, 
I said, you know what, I'm really more interested in vascular endothelial. So I drag it over to the right, and uh, everything changes. And I, uh, I think it's actually off my page here. Let's see if I can. Still off my page. Um, no, I'll just uh, go on. But the, um, you, the, what's interesting is you get to actually interact with the brain. Um, we have other industries we're involved in, and uh, one of them is legal. It's, you know, it's really, I know you guys have heard of the Enron collapse, right, when Enron blew up. And we were sitting with an attorney showing the brain we built on those documents. And we actually went right to the person, to the persons that made the problem in, uh, in about six minutes. He told us it took him six months, uh, 350 attorneys, and hundreds of millions of dollars. So the brain has this amazing ability to kind of learn about things um, uh, automatically and dynamically. Um, so um, the other thing you can do is uh, visualize your results. So if I want to, I can actually uh, come into a wheel. And let me close my screen here. But I can actually dive into things. So um, I can, every one of these clusters is built dynamically and named automatically, but uh, as I kind of I can traverse the search results that I just did with angiogenesis, and as I get to the last cluster, I can click on it and see uh, there was only one document in that cluster. And I can visualize the document and see it. Um, anyway, I wanted to show you that. Um, so the brain has the ability to, to learn dynamically from any set of content very, very quickly. Now, the application I wanted to show you we call BrainSpace Web. So this is the one that's powered by Twitter. Oh, in question, yes, sir. Sure. <laughs> Love it. Say it again. Oh, um, so you want to go back to this? Yeah. Sure. And this is a quarter million documents. So. Say again. So it's a G name. S C N one A. One A. Let's see if the brain knows about that. Yeah, I, mean, uh, I only have a quarter million documents. <laughs> um, we have, uh, by the way, been given the entire corpus of Science Direct. Okay. And we're going to be building a brain on that. Um, um, so, I wanted to show you this product. So, you hear a lot about social networks and why, why doesn't a social network always work? Well, everybody's been a part of the social network, and they're great if you know people, but there's a big difference between a social network and like an interest graph. Um, I mean, you think inside of organizations, organizations don't want Facebook behind their firewall. Even communities don't really want Facebook behind their firewall. It's, who knows who is not that important. If you're in a community around a certain topic or in, in a science community, what you want to know is who knows what. That's not a social network, that's an interest graph. So a social network connects people by who knows who, an interest graph connects people by who knows what. I built several topics. So, and again, my collections here are things that I built just by um, collecting documents I find on the web and through this, through, through this product. I like 3D printers and uh, uh, brain space, of course. Future of education, kind of like Elon Musk is a really interesting topic for me. I think he's doing some amazing things and I'm not a big GMO fan. Um, supercars is something I made with my son. But um, these are things that I, I just found, articles I found on the web, and I created some buckets, and I'm collecting them. Now, what's interesting in our system is each one of those collections now becomes a magnet. It starts to attract things that are related to my interests. The first page I have just shows me the top articles from all my different collections that are being attracted by all my collections. You know, so I have a semantic search guy, I have a semantic search collection. Um, you know, I've got the thing on corporate culture. Um, I have a 3D printer and a profile, so I, I get the, the, to see kind of what's happening um, in my collections. I can also choose a collection in, uh, uh, in whole, so I can say, um, I'm going to look at my 3D printer profile, I can click on that, and actually will look at the six documents I had collected in 3D printers and see what they're attracting today. So these are the documents that they're attracting today, uh, you can kind of see it gets kind of fun because, um, interest, interestingly enough, we try to make, we're trying to get away from this idea of search, you know, always doing keywords, Boolean, and things like that. But wouldn't it be great if you could find an article you like, um, and you could just take it and drag it to the brain. So I'm on the web. I can detach this card almost like a Pinterest board, right? 
I can detach the card and I can drag it to the brain. And the brain will read the document, understand what it's about, and bring me other things that are related. You know, so that was about 3D scanning and things like that. So um, you can start to see even what the brain has learned about certain topics. And this is not formatted very well. This is still beta, but just to give you an idea, I can see the kind of words it's bringing to, to uh, bring back my results that the brain's using. From it, that's extracting from extracting and inferring from all my articles, um, but I get the ability to to also be anywhere on the web that I want. Let's um, let's go uh, out to Google, and uh, let's see. Uh, let's just give me a topic. <laughs> Something. Come on. Malaria. Malaria. Perfect. Okay. Okay, let's just go find an article on malaria. Um, here's one. Let's just take this in, for instance. Okay, so what's great is BrainSpace can follow me anywhere. This is part of that idea of putting it in the fabric of your of your uh, community. Like if, it, if this was just a product you had to be in all the time to use it, that's not really being in the fabric of your life or in the community, right? What if anywhere I could be on the web, BrainSpace could be with me? So this intelligence that me and all our friends are creating together, this, this collective intelligence we're all creating together, could actually, it's sound on it. <laughs> the, that that uh, collective intelligence follows us around. So if I see this article, um, and I can, let me just turn my sound off. Uh, I can hit the brain up in my uh, toolbar, and basically, uh, toolbar pops down. Now eventually what's going to happen is right up here, uh, kind of between brain space and there, a number is occurring. Uh, basically a number pops up. And the first thing the number is going to say is, here's a number of articles that have been curated inside your community that are related to what you're looking at right now. So you click the number and you're taken to a news page of related articles that are related to that that you just found on the web. Second thing I can do is I can actually just store it in one of my collections. So if I don't have a collection, I can, I can, create, a, I can create a new one. So I don't have a collection of malaria, so I can just say, Malaria, and great collection. And there's a, there we go. So if I come back over to my uh, product, I can uh, go find my malaria profile built on one document I found on the web. There it is. Click on it. <coughs> and basically reads that article, understands what it's about, and brings you back things that are related to malaria. What is that? Wow. <laughs> Some interesting stuff. <laughs> uh, but you get the idea, this is a very, very simple thing. And the reason why I wanted to show you the product before this one was because we're going to incorporate some of those things here. So you'll be able to click on a document, flip it over, um, any one that you have, you'll be able to flip it over and have those slider bars. So the brain will show you all that it's extracted from that document and things that it actually is uh, uh, inferring that are related to that document. You'll be able to interact with the brain, flip it back over, and run discovery on that. So we're trying to take the search out of search, if you will, let people interact with the brain, and, and, uh, and uh, kind of reinvent the way we do discovery. Um, eventually, also, you'll be discoverable. You know, so also, um, if I come to my profile, you saw, you saw me, I can be discoverable. Um, someone can come and see, if I allow my collections to be discoverable, some can be private, of course, but if I allow my collections to be discoverable, someone can find me by one of my interests. And they can also use one of my interests to find more things. Let's say they're kind of interested in GMOs. They can just click the little brain next to my GMO profile and be taken to all the articles that are being attracted today by those articles I'm collecting. So um, it gets a, you start to take the search out of search. If you can drag something to a brain, if you can um, collect documents, you can have things that become attractive to you. And we're actually out to reinvent kind of how publishing occurs. So imagine this. So with the community of people out there building collections and doing searching and learning about things, you could write a document in, this, in, the, in, the, in the product. And while you're writing it, a little number could occur up in the right-hand corner. And that number is basically all the people that are going to get it when you hit publish. So writing a blog post or something like that, instead of you, in the way it's done today, sending an email blast out or putting out a blog and waiting for people to find it, the article actually finds people that are interested in it. So it does a complete reversal on publishing. Um, and so that's 
coming in the future. We also have this idea for memory. And how many times have you collected something and you forget about it? it happens to all of us, right? Well, what if you had this place where anytime you found something interesting, you could just click a button and it drops in there. And then in the future, say six months later, you're writing about something, basically it pops it up and says, hey, you found something that's related to what you're writing about about six months ago. Let me show that to you right now. Would you like to incorporate it in? Would you like to build a collection on this? You know? So offers is almost a, uh, uh, what I need more, probably more than anybody, a, uh, an artificial memory. <laughs> um, the other things we're putting in here are allowing you to kind of follow people in context. You know? So uh, I have some people uh, in our organization. Actually, I'll, uh, let me uh, approach it from up here. Um, and so if you have two or three or five or ten or more friends that you like to uh, just kind of see what each other are collecting and sharing and collaborating on, you can do that. So David's one of the guys in my company. He usually collects some pretty interesting stuff. Every once in a while, I just go browse the stuff he's collecting. He's permissioned me to do that. You know, so no one else can do that except me or anyone else he allows to do it. But um, I get to kind of see what he's doing. So the big data brain drain, why is science in trouble? It's interesting. David collect on that. <laughs> um, but these, you know, he, <coughs> he tends to have a lot of very interesting articles that he reads. Um, and again, anything I, I see that I like, I can take it, I can drag it to the brain, or I can click here and share it with someone, or I can just like it. So I drag that to the brain. So I'll read the article, understand what it's about, and start connecting with other stuff that's related. Um, so, I didn't read the article, but there's apparently less about women in academia. <laughs> But uh, anyway, so this, um, I'll stop here and ask or see if there's any questions. But I um, think the net of it is we're trying to do two things. One is we want to transform the way people are searching and discovering, make it easier. So you don't have to know how to build a long really inquiry. You can interact with the brain. You can see words that you didn't know were even related. Explore them, see if they are, add them to your query just by dragging a slider bar. The second thing is adding a social aspect. So as people are interacting with systems, you can get smart about it. You can learn about these things. So communities of people can build a collective intelligence that everybody gets to use to connect with other people and things. And that's the vision for a brain space community. Yes? Uh, I suppose there's two kind of families of problems you're, you're solving. One is huge amounts of data yeah. which you have to understand. But the other is drawing inference between, mm -hmm. between things. Right. And you mentioned your, you've got all your patents in there. Mm -hmm. And one of the things about patents is the authors are trying to be as duplicitous as possible exactly right. and trying to redo the same concepts with different words and exactly right. really, really avoid <laughs> um, inference. Yep. So I, I suppose your product is suited <coughs> to that kind of thing. So we, how did you sort We that? figured that out, and that was one of the problems we encountered. So LexisNexis is our client, our uh, largest uh, patent product in the world. We, we, we power the patent product all over the world. Um, one of the big problems that, that came up was um, patents are gamed. It's exactly what you said. So they have patent classes, right? So if you have a, a patent on a certain engine uh, function, you'll try to put in a patent class that looks at lawnmowers, but it's, you did it really for cars. <laughs> so it's, uh, lawyers are very, very tricky in that sense. So we did something interesting. We took each patent and we, we broke it into pieces. So every patent is what we call has a bunch of shingles. So if a patent is 10 pages long, it might have three shingles a page, 30 shingles, 30 pieces. We also didn't pay any attention to patent classes. So initially, we, whoa, uh, initially uh, they wanted us to build on patent classes and we did and we, did, and we noticed that, you know, that it was the gaming affected the brain. When we threw away patent classes, did our own clustering. So now, the first thing we shingled into little pieces, right? And then we clustered all the shingles. So related shingles kind of popped in different buckets. And then we built brains on those buckets. And so that's how we got around the problem, <coughs> is that we paid no attention to the social systems that are in the patent system that are making it so hard and difficult. Trust our technology uh, to take the smaller pieces of patents, cluster them together, and we built brains on that. So the Lexus brain, and again, 350 million shingles, um, it's about nine different brains, and they're all connected together. The user never sees any of that. They can highlight a paragraph, put in a word, and they're automatically connected to the brain that matters, and it writes the query <laughs> and connects them. Did that answer your question? I think yeah, so. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> but that, it's funny you didn't mention that. That was the, one of the biggest problems we ran into with patents, because they're, they're game for sure. We also mixed the brain, by the way. We didn't just use patents. We also mixed them with uh, journal articles. 
So we took um, their parent companies, Reed Elsevier, and we took, I think, 40 million journal articles and seeded them in with the patents. Another reason we did that was because the brain, when you teach it all on patents, was learning patentees. Mm -hmm. Patentees is not English. <laughs> Do you have a base corpus that's common to all your instances, or is it no. from scratch every time? No, nope, from scratch every time. And it, and it makes a difference, right, because different collections of documents have different signatures. This is why it's important. Think about organizations. Every organization had their own brain space that was built from their curation. So this is really interesting, right? What are businesses? They're conversations, right? Conversations about their products, conversations about their research, conversations about their markets, all those things. If you can build a brain on the curation of documents <coughs> around those topics, every brain in every corporation is going to be completely different because they have different signatures of how they share knowledge. So our vision is that corporations will all have their own brain, and the brain is created by the people and how they share documents. Any other questions? Come on. So did you say you can say it in a sort of an auto track mode, so it will just whatever I'm doing, it will keep an eye on me and say, well, I just thought you were doing that, and this might be um, it wouldn't do it well automatically. It will pop up a document. You can actually drag the document to the brain. We are talking about a document view where you could actually, when you're reading a document, as you're reading it, you could just go, you know, and here's some people inside your company that know about that. Here's some other documents that are related. And here's some uh, people on the web. Well, perhaps I'll share a link rather than actually open the document. That's right. Will it, will it track through a book? Um, so we have a reader inside the document. If I click on this one right here, um, we have a reader inside the document, which is kind of nice because it takes out all the, the trash. Very easy to use, but I'm one click away from going to the actual document yeah. online. See the best of both worlds. The readers are easy. And the, the, the uh, writing tool is going to be just like that. You'll be able to write something uh, in, the, in the product, and as you write, you'll be able to see people that are interested in what you're writing. So the brain becomes this thing that starts to connect everything. Another important thing is I've heard in this conference over and over and over again is we have all these different silos. So there's you know lots of different data over here, and there's data over here, and data over here, data over here. And every time that someone wants to go to one of those silos, they have to log out and go to those silos. Brain space can sit on top of all of them. So one search can search into all the different databases and bring you back the results in one place using a brain. So we actually have um, instances where a brain is um, we built a brain on a certain set of documents. We had internally used that brain to search the web. So it gives you a perspective as you go out, if you will. <laughs> um, anything else? Does the corporation, corporation's information, whatever it is, end up in your silo? And then yeah. can you can you get can you get information out of your uh, dump out of your system that's portable? Is there any information short of just a list of URLs that's in there? That's, that's um, kind of sensitive. Let me see if I understand your question. But in, like, so a corporation, obviously, they have uh, privacy issues with their documents. I, I was actually saying you're forming a big silo. The brain, you mean? Yeah. Okay. An instance in a, in a corporation, mm -hmm. um, and they're you know they're paying for your product and mm -hmm. they're getting the benefit, and the mm -hmm. time comes when there's another product that's better. Mm -hmm. um, so they've lock themselves into your system, and let's say they want to migrate that data out. Okay. Uh, is the only kind of migratable data just the list of URLs they've exported? The documents. Or? Yeah, I mean, the magic of what we do is that we'll, we'll take documents and convert them into this, this brain, this, this hyperspace, if you will. That's unique to us. We can't transport. Yeah, sure. Yeah, but what's interesting about it is it's, it's also very secure. That brain itself is just built of a bunch of 26-digit numbers. You can't look at a brain and, and back propagate what someone's doing. <laughs> so yeah, uh, but brains are built from documents. So the way the way out is to take the same documents used to build the brain and put it in the new system. So it's uh, pretty simple and portable. Um, yeah. Anything else? Great. Thank you very much. <laughs>